So I know that this house is longing to build a culture of power and the miraculous and you're stepping into this. And uh, how many of you know John Wimber is, is famous for saying faith is spelled R-I-S-K and how many of you know that's true? If you're wanting to step into the supernatural, if you want to press into the more of God, it's going to require you to reach the end of your ability. You're going to get to the end of your ability and then all of a sudden, oh, I'm at the edge of the boat. I need to step out of the boat and try and walk on water if I want to see a culture of the miraculous. It preaches well. It sounds great. We can say yes and amen. That's awesome. We want to see a move of the Spirit of God. Yes. And then all of a sudden there's someone in a wheelchair in front of you. I'm out on the street. Oh, there's a, there's a drug addict that needs Jesus. Mm, feels a little bit easier to yell that when I'm in the comfort of the four walls of the church. Oh, I want to see a mighty move of the Spirit of God. We want to see revival in our church. We want to see you cascade down with glory. We long for that, Jesus. But that person, why are they yelling? Why are they screaming? So are they getting delivered? Is that demonic? Is that God? Oh, was that person actually healed? Oh, I don't know. That was, maybe that was the flesh. I don't know if I actually know if that was the Lord or not. Right? If we ask for the miraculous and we ask for glory, we ask for an invasion of a culture of his presence, I'm telling you, hallelujah, from someone who's lived this out for 12 years at Bethel Church, you are signing up to be uncomfortable. Yeah. Hooray! You're signing up to step outside of your ability. You're saying, God, I want you to invade. And so if you want the Lord to invade, that means... He's going to invade. <gasps> God, can't you be gentle and kind and tender? Yes, he can sometimes. Except, I'm so sorry to tell you, he's responding to what you're asking for. Oftentimes, the most confronting and uncomfortable thing is he's actually responding to what it is that we asked for. God, we want it. And then all of a sudden, he comes and we're like, I don't know if I want it. In fact, I don't think I do want it. Revival will cost you everything. He's worth it because you get Jesus in the exchange. But I'm here to tell you, as someone that's lived this out in my culture for 12 years, it'll cost you something. And that's okay. But just be aware of what you're asking for. And then understand, if you want it, you have an internal world that you are responsible to manage. When God starts to break out, you have an internal world to manage. Can you recognize this is actually an answer to, to prayer that I've been asking. I wanted this. Yeah. When that person is messy and, and snot streaming down their face and you don't really like that or they're yelling and you can't hear the preacher or with singing too long or I'm not finding my parking space because all of a sudden the nations are actually coming. I can't fit on the tram anymore. I can't sit on my little pew that I used to sit on for 20 years. This is an answer to something that you wanted. That is not the devil. That is not the flesh. That is God coming on behalf of your cry and saying, here I am. But he's saying, can you recognize me? Can you see me when I actually respond? Because the problem is he oftentimes doesn't respond the way we want him to. We have a preconceived idea of what he's going to do. Come, Lord Jesus. Come through the lens of how I want it to look exactly. Good luck with that one. He just doesn't. If we're wanting to see a culture of the miraculous and we're wanting to see power, I'm telling you, you're going to have to move beyond your ability. The scripture says, but without faith, it's impossible to please God, right? What's terrifying to me is that how many churches I see around the world have built very, very, very successful ministries and sometimes I don't even know if God's even there. We can be so seeker sensitive and so friendly to people and create this place where we're so pleasing to man that we don't even realize that we're not even pleasing to God. We can have favor, we can have attention, we can have breakthrough, we can have thousands of people in our auditoriums, but we've never actually stepped out of the boat and have, have it require us to have faith. And everyone might celebrate you, praise you. Wow, look at what God is doing down the road. There's thousands of people attending that church. Yeah, but they've built it through their own ability. Oh, that terrifies me. 
that I could be pleasing to man, displeasing to God at the same time. We have to be willing, like Jesus, to grow in favour with man and favour with God. Ooh, I'm really nice, I am. I'm preaching to myself just as much as I'm preaching to you, but I'm telling you from someone who's navigated some of this, I'm trying to come with some keys to go, hey, I, I promise he's going to come, and he is coming. And it's going to require something of us, and we have to think a different way. We have to see things a completely different way. If God's coming in a new way, that requires us to see him a different way and to respond a different way. If you're wanting a, a culture of power and the miraculous, and I know you do, you don't just need risk. You don't need just stepping out in faith. Well, that's obviously incredibly important. You ultimately need intimacy. It's like the secret source of a, a supernatural culture for so many reasons, right? Intimacy with God is, is the whole point. We're going to share a lot more on that tonight. But w- why is it such a key in a supernatural culture? Right, the title of my message, you guys have probably already seen it. I'm not sure if we have or not. I'm not very good with titles of my message. Sorry, forgive me. Uh, he is the Lord. And I am not. He is the Lord and I am not. So when we're like yelling like we were just a moment before, yours is the power, yours is, right? What a great song. His is the power, the kingdom and the glory, right? Who's his? Not mine. Yours. And so what we do as a posture of, this, uh, of a son is to come in low and say, not, not my will be done. I don't lead me. I'm not the Lord of my own life. You are, you are the Lord. And so if I want to step into that which is your domain, it means that I am not in control and I am not in charge, but you are. And so intimacy with Jesus and connection to him enables us to handle another key we're going to have to overcome in the pursuit of the more of God, and that is tensions and the mystery of God. Oh, you're crying out for the miraculous. I love it. Crying out. And you, you got people up the front here and we're going after miracles, signs and wonders and, and we're seeing it. And amen. We're going to see more and more and more. I believe that there has to be a, an availability in God where we, we see such breakthrough in, in the sick being healed that we've never seen before. I believe for that. Who's believing for that? Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. All your hands are up. You know what you're signing up for as well? Disappointment. I'm just going to say it because if we don't pass this test of the mystery of God, we're not going to see more because if we think I come with a preconceived idea of I cry out for the miraculous, I'm going to see everyone healed. I believe that's available, but I as yet haven't seen that. I don't know if there's anybody on the earth that's ever seen that. Every single person that they pray for gets healed. I want that. But the reality is if you want to see resurrection power flow through your life, guess what you have to look for? Dead things. If I want to see that, according to Scripture, says the same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead flows through me. Oh, that preaches so good. I'm telling you, it's not very comfortable when you lay your hands on one of your dear friend's two-year-old dead daughters and you do your best and you pray your best prayer and you do all that you know to do. You fast, you contend, you cry out, but you hand her back dead. Welcome to contending for a supernatural culture. Welcome. Welcome to contending for what Jesus Christ paid for in full. We have to at least be willing to face that. I'm not going to believe for that. I'm going to believe for breakthrough, of course. But because I believe for breakthrough, then I continue to lay my hands on the dead. That's the guarantee of the answer is that I continue to lean in and press in and say, God, I know what you promised and I'm going to expect to see it. And even if I don't see it this time that I pray, I'm going to expect it next time that I pray. I raised a sheep from the dead, but that's a whole other story. That was wild. But I haven't yet seen someone raised from the dead. But you know what? I've put myself in very, very uncomfortable situations. I've been to morgues. I've seen decomposing bodies. I've placed my hands on the dead. I have. And I'll continue to do it because I know. Jesus has paid for this in full. This is my inheritance. Yeah. Jesus gave this to me. But I have to be willing to face the fact that sometimes it doesn't happen. Mm. He's promised to be our comforter. But we love, don't we? Me included. We love to run and hide back in what's comfortable. 
And actually, when we do that, when we create a culture of our own comfort, we miss out on the promise that he said, I will be your comforter. The promise of he being our comforter means he's going to place us in situations that are uncomfortable. That's the side of the, of the, the truth of that promise. I will comfort you if you go into places that are uncomfortable. But if you continually to medicate your own comfort, if you look for your own comfort by, I don't know, Netflix or or YouTube or Instagram or wealth or money or alcohol or whatever it might be, you're searching for your own comfort. You're actually stepping out of the ability for him to comfort you. So we have to have this ability, this self diagnosis of going, hang on, it's not, I'm not saying watching Netflix or YouTube is wrong. I love watching golf YouTube videos. Hallelujah. Sorry, I'm a mad golfer. It's good. Me and Dave went out with uh, Dr. Alan. It was so fun. Played golf yesterday. Hallelujah. We're not going to talk about the front nine. We're only going to talk about the back nine. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, but if <laughs> it's not wrong to be watching YouTube, but I'm telling you, it is wrong to disobey God. If you know internally, oh, I'm actually flicking this on because I feel uncomfortable. I've had a hard day. Um, I'm spinning internally and I need comfort. Oh, have I run to something other than the comforter? You're stepping outside of the promise. And I'm just here to say it's not going to satisfy you. It's actually going to continue that spiral on. You're going to feel more and more and more lack of ease inside of your world because you're running to something that ultimately doesn't satisfy. Tensions, guys. Tensions in the body of Christ. Mature Christianity is measured in many different ways, one of which is the ability to hold truth held in tension. We're going to open up the scriptures. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. We're going to dive in really quick. Oh, Jesus, thank you. Who would love to be around the Christ when he's teaching about how to pray? (laughs) <laughs> like what an incredible gift these disciples had. They literally got the saviour of the world, the person who answers prayer, telling them how to pray. That's like a secret cheat code. Jesus is sitting them down and saying this to them. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask Him. Okay, perfect. Jesus has told us how to pray. Amazing. That settled it. I don't need to be like the heathen. I don't need to repeat myself. I don't need to contend and ask and and pray for things because the Father already knows what I need of. Thank you, Jesus, the Word of God Himself. Thank you for communicating to me how to pray. Awesome. Settled. Done. And then Jesus continues on in the very same message he continues to to preach and share and then we get to Matthew chapter 7 verses 7 to 8 and then he says ask and it will be given to you (laughs) seek and you will find knock and it will be open to you I actually believe a better translation looking into it is ask and keep on asking and it will be given to you seek keep on seeking and you will find knock Keep on knocking and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be open. Verse 11 then says, If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Jesus, I'm really confused. In the same message, you have said the complete polar opposite about the same topic, about how to pray. You said, the Father already knows what you need. You don't even need to ask Him. And He says, how much more will the Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? You don't need to ask. You don't need to contend. You don't need to use vain repetition. Ask, keep asking, seek, keep seeking, knock, keep knocking. I'm like, well, hang on here a second. Which one is it? (laughs) And this is the gift of intimacy. This is the gift of intimacy. And this is the gift of our ability to hold truth held in tension in a supernatural culture because which one is true? Yes. Yes and amen. They are both true. They are both real. It's still the same Christ declaring this is how to pray. This is how to approach me. But how do we know which one he's emphasizing? Friendship. 
Which one is it? It requires me to be close enough to not build my life on what he has spoken to me yesterday, but I'm current in my relationship with him and I'm leaning into intimacy to know which side of the coin he's emphasizing right now. Faith comes by hearing, right? Hearing by the word of God. It's the ability to hear what he's saying now. And that is where I put my trust. Not some outside reality. Faith isn't just some weird out there reality like the world. That's like the universe giving me something. Like that's demonic manifestation. Sometimes that's how we bring our perspective of faith into our walk with God. It's not some out there weird number. No, it's the voice. The only reason I have faith is because of the person who spoke it I can have faith in. Because he has spoken something, then I put my faith in that because of my intimate connection to the one who has spoken it. Intimacy and friendship. Another monster key if we're wanting to build this culture of the supernatural. Intimacy helps you recognize him when he appears to you in a less obvious package. Let's open the scripture again. Matthew 14. This is a very, very famous passage. I'm not going to preach this passage, although I love preaching this passage. It's very, very fun. You guys know this story. Uh, This is when Peter walks on the water. I'm going to dive into verse 25. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Peter is my favorite. I love Peter. I see so much Peter in myself, just radical out there, all in, making so many mistakes, so many blunders. Oh, I pray that Jesus doesn't say to me at some point, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> oh, man. But I, I love this guy. He's just so all in. But Peter is an experienced fisherman, right? He's in the middle of this giant storm. Much more used to wild sea than what you or I would be. This is how he makes his livelihood pre-Jesus. He's very used to being in these situations. He's out in this extreme storm. How big must the storm be that a disciple of Jesus who's following him, is with him night and day, cannot recognize him to the point, fear had so overwhelmed him that he couldn't even recognize Jesus with his eyes. In fact, he thought he was a ghost. The scripture says because of fear. Isn't that interesting? How fear can cloud our ability to see. Fear can stop us from actually recognizing Jesus. Jesus, it said in a different passage, that Jesus was going to pass them by. (laughs) I much prefer the calm, cuddly, nice Jesus that, you know, the Psalm 23, good shepherd. Jesus was going to walk straight past his disciples in the middle of a Such an extreme storm that he looked like a ghost to them. And he wasn't going to rescue them. Good job, guys. Keep going. Doing so well. I'll see you on the other side, like I promised. Good job. The other passage says they were rowing directly into a headwind. Hang on, I thought when it was God's promise, everything just opens up for me and it's really easy. I thought Jesus rescued us from every storm. Sometimes he enables us to stay in a storm and not rescue us because he's actually trying to teach us that we have the authority to walk on the storm that we are in the middle of. And if he pulls us out of it and rescues us from it, we never learn the authority that we have. He cannot recognize Jesus with his eyes. This is the craziest, I think, the craziest request in all of Scripture. I am so petrified, so terrified, I actually literally think that you're a supernatural being, that you're a ghost. I'm in the boat that is the safest, smartest place to be. If it's you, Jesus, 
command me to come out to you, weird ghost, supernatural creature, out on the storm where I'm going to drown? Like, what kind of a request is that? Have you ever stopped and think about these stories? I'm like, what would I have done? I don't know what I would have done. Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you. I cannot recognize you with my eyes, right? But I know what happens when you speak. I've been around you long enough. I know that your words are both spirit and they are life. I know that I've been in impossible situations and all of a sudden you've spoken and my heart was petrified, terrified, didn't believe. All of a sudden you spoke, something happened in my spirit where it made way more sense for a leper to be healed than a leper to stay full of leprosy. I know that if you speak, I'm going to go from being so petrified, so terrified, so overwhelmed with fear that when you speak, your words are going to impact my heart where I'm so petrified of the storm All of a sudden, because of the grace and the power and the Spirit on your words, if it's you, all of a sudden, it's going to make way more sense for me to walk to you over the water in the middle of the storm than it is to stay in the boat. This is another massive key for us in how to build supernatural culture. It's we have to be able to recognize him when he's not easily recognizable. Jesus is moving in a room. I'm telling you, at times, it's difficult to know what the heck's going on. (laughs) Is it you, Lord? I don't know. But I humble myself and I have an expectancy in my spirit that you are moving. And because I have an expectancy that you are moving, I'm going to approach you like you are moving. If I can't see you with my eyes, I'm going to to see if I can recognise your voice. And this is the beauty of Peter. He's, he's saying like we can recognize him in multiple different ways if we lean in to friendship. I can recognize my wife's voice on the phone. She doesn't need to be in the room. I have my eyes closed in a room this big. If she spoke out right now, I know it was her. Why? Because I'm intimately connected to her. I can recognize her voice. I don't need to see her. I can recognize her in a different way. If you want a culture of miracles, you have to be willing to yield your your leadership and your lordship for his. Is God as big as my brain or is he allowed to be bigger than that? Because the supernatural requires you to go beyond the natural. Your capacity to understand it has to be yielded to your capacity to not understand it, but be able to recognize him in it. Philippians 4, we're going to turn there really quick. Philippians 4 verse 6. I think it's going to show up on your screen in a minute if I can find my notes. Thank you, Jesus. You guys know this passage. You know this promise well. Be anxious for nothing. Oh. That'll preach. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which surpasses, is greater than, goes beyond your understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. That's an incredible promise. It's also a horrible promise. It's terrifying. He's saying that there is a peace that can guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. I love that part. But he's saying that there is a peace that's beyond your ability to understand. There is a peace that's available that you only access when you go beyond your ability to understand it. Why do you think the Prince of Peace has reserved peace for you beyond your understanding? Because he's leading you there. Peace isn't the absence of chaos, it's the presence of a person. The only reason you're being guarded in your mind and your heart is because you're being guarded in your heart and mind in Jesus. And because when you're following Jesus, sometimes like Peter, he's like, hey, you know how you normally walk on ground? Yeah, I'm going to ask you to walk on water today. There's a peace here. If you come, you can actually be with me. You can find peace in the middle of a storm if you want to. But it's going to require you, if you're longing for a supernatural culture, and I believe you are here, there's going to be times where he's asking you to walk on water. And there's actually going to be times where you start to sink too. 
But if you are intimately connected with him, you're going to have these experiences like Peter had, where you've stepped way beyond your comfort zone and you have access to him in a way that you never have had before. Mm. Matthew 17, verse 1 to 8, again, another famous passage. I'm going to dive straight into to verse number 1 here. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. You, you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased hear him and when the disciples heard it they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid but Jesus came touched them and said arise and do not be afraid and when they had lifted up their eyes they saw no one but Jesus only again I, I love the heart of Peter I, I just love his his desire to to be with Jesus and just radically respond when he thinks that there's a moment to radically respond. But what's terrifying to me is that Peter has probably been crying out to see the reality of the glory of this Savior that he's given his life to follow. Wow, Jesus himself, the Messiah, is here. I want to see his glory. And here he is before the transfigured Christ. And the scripture says, then Peter answered. Answered what? Jesus never asked him a question. You don't want to be answering questions that Jesus hasn't asked. He's finding himself in this place of glory. The desire of his heart is being manifested right in front of him. Moses, Elijah and Jesus are having a conversation in front of him. This is not the time to interject. This is not the time to try and come up with a solution or do something or act. This is a time to behold. This is a time to look and see and fall on your face and understand that this is an answer to the cry of your heart. The the glory of the, the Lord is in front of you. What's he answering? If he's not answering Jesus, he's answering his inner dialogue. The racing thoughts. Guys, how many of you have been in glory meetings? Like even like today, this morning, the presence of God comes in, the glory of God comes in and the weight of the Lord comes in. I've been in meetings where all of a sudden the, the musicians don't want to play another note. No person wants to grab a microphone. Nobody wants to touch it because the Lord has come. And you'll be in these moments of presence and glory and within maybe 20, 30 seconds, somebody's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I can't handle it. Uh, our God is an awesome God. Here. Like, I have to do something. I have to, I have to respond. I, uh, let's go after miracles. Let's, let's, let's go after the prophetic utterance. Let's build Moses and Elijah a new tent. Like, let's do something because we haven't cultivated a secret place where we are designed for glory. Where we've cultivated, this is actually home. This is where I was designed to be is to be with him in his glory. This is my natural habitat. This is what I long for. This is the answer of what I've been contending for. I don't need to do anything in this moment. I get to be. How uncomfortable is it sometimes, right, when you're in the presence of God? But how quick do we resort to doing? And doing, oh, guys, doing is not wrong when the Lord is speaking it, right? We just talked about faith. Responding when he's whispering to us. That's when glory cascades and increases when we respond to what he's saying. But when we're only responding to our inner dialogue, we can say some crazy things. I don't want to be in a meeting. Imagine if I was speaking right now, all of a sudden a glory cloud appeared here in the middle of the sanctuary. And got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and darker and darker and darker. And the father's voice booms out of heaven and says, this is my beloved son. (laughs) 
hear him. Basically, Peter, shut up. For real. This is a rebuke from the Father. The Son is in front of you. Why are you speaking? What do you possibly think that you have to add to this situation? Do you think that you are the key of increase and breakthrough in this moment? I have Jesus Christ, the Son, my boy, is in front of you. Hear him. If he's not saying anything, that's okay. Be. Be. If you want glory, you want revival, you want presence, oh, you better learn how to pass this test. Be. Be. First and foremost, have your priorities set in your heart. Be. That is the most important. I will be with the Lord. If he shows up, that is my priority. I lock in. I will be with the Lord. I won't add anything unless he tells me to. Resist with all of your heart to step back into busy, to leadership, to building something. There's a time and a space for that. But if you want glory, then everything has to shift when he actually steps in. Don't respond to the internal world. Respond to his voice. Guys, I've been in literal glory cloud experiences. I know that's a controversial thing in some portions of the church. I've been in literal glory clouds with tangible, actual, physical glory for hours where I have a wave of actual physical glory from above my head to the tips of my toes that you can feel, taste, see, exploding in mid-air. I've seen the craziest things. It was actually the first month that I was at Bethel. That was the season where that was happening. I don't have a grid for that. I, don't, I had no idea. It's impossible to get your head around what is happening. Like how, I'm literally putting my hand on the wall because for me it looks like it's coming out the wall. I'm like, not that I doubt it, but your mind cannot grasp what is happening in front of you. You're like, I cannot understand. I turn around, it's coming, it's going upwards. Over here it's coming down. Over there it's going sideways. I'm like, my mind cannot comprehend this. In those moments of glory, I have to be willing to go beyond my ability to understand what the heck is going on. If he would entrust himself to me, my responsibility is to say thank you. This is the answer that I've been longing for. If the Lord would entrust himself in intimacy in such a way that he would reveal measures of glory to me, I do not want to add to it. I don't need to add to it. In fact, I can't. I don't want the Lord to say, shut up, Ben. I don't. And neither do you. We don't want that. But it is so uncomfortable, guys, as a church. We feel it as leaders. I promise you, when the glory of God comes and there's an agenda and there's, there's time and we know there's another service and, and you know, we want to honour this preacher and we want to get the offering done, we feel, we feel that. You feel that. We have to make a choice if we want revival to do things a different way. And you have to be okay if we don't take up the offering. You have to be okay if the preacher doesn't get up. You have to be okay if worship goes longer or is shorter. It's not about that. It's about Him. If He comes into the room, we stop everything. The Lord is here. Hear Him. Hear Him. Amen. Exodus 24, really quick, last passage together. You guys doing okay? Don't worry, I'm preaching to myself as much as I'm preaching to you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Exodus 24, verse 12. Then the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and be there and I'll give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments which I have written that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua and Moses went up on the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man has a difficulty, let him go to them. 
Then Moses went up into the mountain and a cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Verse 16 again, now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Here we have this invitation from the Lord, inviting Moses up on the mount to first be with him. It's the first call. It's the clarion call of any leader, of any friend of God. The first call is to come and be with the Lord. Come and be with him. So that connecting, that spending time together and then the glory of the Lord starts to cover the mountain and the cloud of his glory covers the mountain and Moses finds himself in the pinnacle of human experience. He's inside of the glory of God. Now he could respond like Peter did to the inner dialogue. Could you imagine what that must have been like? On the other side of a covenant of grace, the inner dialogue that must have been going on. The scripture says, on the seventh day, God spoke. What's the inference? That Moses said nothing for six days. We can last six minutes. I'm so uncomfortable in the glory of God. Moses recognized, I'm home. This is what I was made for. Yeah. He is shown up in glory. I have nothing to add. It's like almost the complete polar opposite to the story of Peter. The cloud comes and they interact and they spend time together. And Peter has no, uh, sorry, Moses has nothing to add. So often we miss out on the glory of God because we fill up the space with ourselves wow. and we refuse to allow God to fill up the space with himself. In this same 40-day encounter, guys, we know the scriptures, the people get so restless with how slow God is moving. They get so concerned. They think that God has left them. The same period of time that Moses is encountering the glory of God, which visibly they can see, they think Moses has left them and, and, and God has left them and they build a golden calf to fashion a God that makes sense to their mind. He's moving too slow. He's left us. He's too big. This is way too uncomfortable for me. Hey, Aaron, make a God. Let it, let it make sense to our mind. The very same period of time that one is having an encounter with the literal glory of God, the people are responding out of the restlessness of their soul and creating a God that they can manage, a God that they can understand, a God that can fit inside of their timelines, a God that doesn't make them feel uncomfortable. And this is the tension. And this is the challenge. In some ways, I'm laying before you today. This is where you're going. This is where you're going. The Lord is beginning to move in this house. His glory is increasing. His presence is only getting stronger. And so we're going to have to learn how to navigate this. Can I fashion a God that makes sense to me or am I willing to move at the speed of God and not the speed of my inner workings? If I want revival, will I yield my lordship and my leadership to his? Can he lead me at a speed that he wants to lead me? Can he be Lord over every area of my life? Because if, if you don't, you're not going to get what you're longing for. Mm. I'm going to pray for you guys. I would have the worship team come back up. That would be amazing. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Now, I would have loved to have come and give you a super encouraging word and 
had a lot of fun together in the presence of God and, and that's needed and necessary, but I really felt strongly from God to get you ready and play a small little part of, of the puzzle of, of getting you ready for what it is that He's doing. And we all have our own responsibility in this process to host God. Make sure that your moments in glory are happening more at home than they are here. Make sure that it feels like home to be in the presence of God alone. Make sure that you're okay when God leads you to do something that's outside of your comfort zone. Build the muscle. Take the risk. Step out. Let God lead you into places that feel uncomfortable for you. And I promise you will meet the reality of the living God in that space. If you're wanting to see revival, I believe you are longing for it. I can feel the the birth pangs of a move of the Spirit of God in this house. Then I'm telling you, when He comes in, fight the urge to do with all that you have. Be. Be with God. Learn how to host His presence. Fight for intimate connection above anything else.